Thank you for the very kind introduction and for having me here at UTM today. Uh, if anyone noticed what I was, uh, uh, my shoes today, I'm not, uh, there's not a new fashion trend in the United States. I just, uh, my, uh, my regular shoes got lost in my luggage on my flight here this morning, so I'm wearing sandals instead, so I apologize. <laughs> So um, these are our two presidential candidates uh, this year in happier times. Uh, this was Donald Trump on the left and Hillary Clinton uh, to, his, to his left. Uh, this is from uh, Trump's wedding in 2005 to Melania Trump, who's on the right, uh, his current wife. Um, back then, uh, Trump, of course, had already been a kind of a celebrity in the United States for a very long time, dating back to the 1980s as uh, a, uh, a real estate developer and also just kind of a uh, public celebrity. Uh, Clinton at that time was a U.S. Senator from uh, New York State uh, and they sometimes uh, uh, traveled in the same uh, social circles. Uh, what I think is notable about the two choices, okay, <laughs> what I think is notable about the two choices uh, that we have this year in the United States is that both of them are very unpopular. Uh, Hillary Clinton's favorability rating is only about 40 percent amongst the general against uh, amongst the public. Our unfavorable rating is about 55 percent. Uh, but Trump is actually a lot worse. His favorability is only in the low 30s. His unfavorability is in the low 60s. And so you have one uh, fairly unpopular candidate in Clinton and a very unpopular candidate uh, in Trump. Just to put that in perspective, uh, it's probable that these are the two most unpopular major party presidential candidates we've ever had in the same election in the United States. Uh, although uh, we, we only have uh, polling really going back to the end of World War II, so maybe there were more unpopular ones, we just don't have the numbers to prove it. Before I talk about this year's race, I just want to talk about sort of the election system in the United States. Um, so what happens is that both major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, will nominate their candidates through a convention, and these conventions were held in July. Uh, the Republicans held uh, their convention in Cleveland, Ohio, which is my hometown, uh, and then the uh, uh, Democrats held their convention in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, for most of American history, the general public, <laughs> for most of American history, the general public did not have much say as to who the uh, presidential nominees were going to be. Uh, the, uh, uh, the convention system started in the 1830s uh, as a way to select the presidential nominees. And what happened was is there were all these delegates that went to the conventions and again, the public didn't really have much say as to who those people actually were. And so you could say that the American presidential uh, nomination process was very much kind of an insider dominated, uh, establishment dominated uh, process. Uh, and, and while in the 20th century a lot of states uh, went to a system in which they had primary elections where actually voters could weigh in as to who they wanted uh, their, their respective parties' choices to be, uh, a lot of these primaries were basically just advisory in nature and they didn't really have much role in terms of de de determining who the delegates were to the conventions who actually made the selections. Um, but then uh, we had 19, the 1968 presidential election in the United States which was uh, very, it came at a very tumultuous time in the United States. Uh, the U.S. at that time was embroiled in a very bloody, very controversial war in Vietnam, and the incumbent president, uh, Democrat Lyndon Johnson, uh, decided not to run for re-election, uh, mostly because of, of uh, the troubles in Vietnam. Uh, that also was a year of a lot of upheaval in the United States. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., the uh, civil rights leader, was assassinated. So too was Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, who was seeking the Democratic presidential nomination and, and was killed after the uh, California primary. And at a very controversial uh, convention in Chicago, Illinois, the Democrats decided to nominate Hubert Humphrey for president. Humphrey was the sitting vice president at the time. And that's despite Humphrey not participating in any of the primaries in that election. Uh, and this caused, this spurred some changes on the, in the Democratic Party in which they uh, tried to make the primaries uh, more meaningful and to give the public a greater voice in the selection of the president. And so starting in the 1970s, the Democrats and then the Republicans followed, uh, started to make the, uh, the primaries more important. And so for the last 45 years or so, uh, instead of the convention process being dominated by kind of party elites and party insiders, 
again, the, uh, the, the voters in each party have more power to, uh, to actually weigh in on who they want the nominee to be. And this is important when looking at 2016 because, as I'll get into in a little bit, uh, Donald Trump in particular is someone who has very little support from what you'd consider to be party insiders. Maybe 50, 60 years ago, he wouldn't have been able to win the nomination. Uh, but in our modern times where uh, party leaders maybe aren't so important, uh, Trump was able to win the nomination despite the fact that those leaders don't really like him. Now, as we move on from the conventions, of course, we now have two official nominees, Clinton and Trump. Uh, we move on to the November election, and uh, of course the, the American uh, presidential election is not simply a strict uh, national popular vote. Uh, we have the electoral college system, uh, which is kind of this confusing mismatch of, uh, of uh, different states with different numbers of votes, and so let me explain how it works. So. Um, what happens is every 10 years we have a census in the United States and that helps determine how many uh, congressional representatives each state receives. So uh, each state, all 50, are entitled to two senators apiece. And so uh, small states like Wyoming, Montana, they get as many senators as states like California and Texas that have many, many times more uh, population. So we have those 100 senators. And then uh, the census determines uh, how the 435 members of the U.S. House are allocated uh, to the certain states. California has 53 representatives, it has the most. Texas has 38, so on and so forth. Uh, if you combine the members of the House from a certain state and those two senators they get, that tells you how many electoral votes uh, a state gets. So for California, 53 members of the House, plus two senators, 55 electoral votes out of 538 total. And you get 538 by 435 members of the House, 100 senators, and then the District of Columbia, our capital, Washington, D.C., um, they do not, D.C. does not have a voting member of the U.S. House, nor does it have senators, but it does get to vote for president, uh, and that's where those additional three electoral votes come from. So that's how we get the number 538. You need 270 to win. Uh, almost all of the states are winner take all in the Electoral College. So. If you win one more vote than your opponent in California, you get all 55 electoral votes. The two exceptions are the states of Nebraska, that number five in the middle of the country, and then the state of Maine, which is in the, uh, the northeastern corner of the country. Uh, they actually award, uh, they award two of their electoral votes representing the senators to the statewide winner in the popular vote. But then they also award electoral votes based on, how, based on the results in the individual congressional districts in those states. Uh, and so you could have a situation in those states where one candidate could win most of the electoral votes, but someone could, could also you know, split the electoral votes by winning a congressional district. And actually, that's what Barack Obama did in 2008. He actually won a congressional district in the state of Nebraska, even though he lost the statewide vote. Uh, quite handily, and Hillary Clinton is also trying to win uh, that uh, single electoral vote in Nebraska uh, in this election. But again, for the most part, it's just it's just straight winner take all. So before we look ahead at the general, I wanted to sort of look back and think about why Clinton got nominated and why Trump got nominated. So the Clinton story, I think, is an easier one to explain. Um, Democrats, at this particular point in time, if you ask them in polls whether they value experience in their own leaders uh, or whether they uh, actually like the, their own leaders of the party, they generally are inclined to say yes. Uh, and Clinton was very much a, a candidate who uh, emphasized her uh, level of experience and also she could boast a lot of institutional support in the party. Uh, she, she was endorsed by most of the sitting members, uh, sitting Democratic members of the U.S. House and Senate, and also by influential party leaders. Um, there's something in American politics called what's called the invisible primary, which is essentially before the formal primary process starts, which is usually in January or February of the general election year, uh, you use the time before that in the so-called invisible primary to kind of consolidate support behind the scenes, raise money, do those sorts of things. And Clinton was a champion of the invisible primary. Again, she got a lot of party support. In fact, so much party support that um, she dissuaded a lot of other prominent Democrats from deciding to run for the nomination. And there's also some research in uh, on primary elections on both sides that uh, even though 
the primary process is not as dominated by insiders as it used to be, uh, that support from party leaders can sometimes be predictive of who gets nominated. And of course, in this case, for Clinton, um, her our massive establishment support was, in fact, predictive of her winning the nomination. Her major opponent was Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, a more liberal candidate from the state of Vermont. Uh, Sanders actually really isn't even a Democrat. He's always been elected as an independent, although um, in terms of his worldview uh, being fairly left-leaning, he's more aligned with the Democratic Party than the Republican Party, which is more conservative. Uh, Sanders probably did uh, significantly better than uh, one might have expected in the primary process, uh, but at the same time, Clinton ended up winning uh, quite comfortably. Uh, the other thing about Clinton and why she won the nomination is that, so the Demo for the first time, we have a woman as a major party presidential nominee in the United States. Uh, Democrats are more the party of women. Women vote more Democratic in, uh, in, in the general election. Republicans are more the party of men. Uh, about 60% of all the primary voters uh, in, in, in the Democratic side are women, and uh, Clinton did particularly well amongst women. And so uh, even though Bernie Sanders did a little bit better amongst men, uh, if you're doing better amongst this big slice of the electorate, uh, that's a good way to win the nomination, and that was very helpful uh, to Clinton. Trump is a lot harder to explain, but I will try. <laughs> so unlike the Democrats, the Republican Party right now is pretty anti-establishment amongst its voters. They don't value uh, a lot of experience with their candidates. Uh, and they don't really like their own party's leaders. So endorsements from party leaders might not mean as much on the Republican side. In fact, they might actually hurt someone as opposed to help them because the, the, the party and its voters are just very anti-establishment right now. And so Trump was uh, someone who had basically no institutional support in the Republican Party, and he did not really run a traditional campaign in terms of raising uh, a lot of money or building a kind of complicated, complex get-out-the-vote operation in certain states. Um, but Trump did have a few things going for them. First of all, he had basically 100% name identification in that he had been a around American life um, for, for decades, and so a lot of people knew who he was. He's kind of a reality television star in the United States. Uh, and he also was able to use his celebrity to generate even more attention for himself. By some estimates, he got about $2 billion worth of um, basically free advertising on cable between his many uh, cable and broadcast television appearances on news shows, and also the fact that a lot, of, um, a lot of his rallies in certain places were covered live by the networks. Uh, it's kind of rare for, or, or he, he got a lot more coverage of his actual events than the other candidates did, and that was sort of, a, um, kind of helped his campaign, I think. And he also had a message that resonated. So the Republican Party, uh, while the Democratic Party is kind of the party uh, more of non-white voters in the United States, the Republican Party base is almost entirely white. And I think that there is some resentment uh, in the Republican Party toward the way the country is changing, both culturally and also in terms of diversity. Uh, there is also a lot of resentment in the Republican Party as to perhaps changes in the economy. Uh, it used to be a lot easier for whites who did not have a college education to get good employment in the United States. Now that goes back probably 30, 40 years to when we had just way more manufacturing jobs and as uh, um, as sort of the world recovered from World War II, um, a lot of those factory jobs sort of went to other places that had cheaper labor, but some places in the United States really have not recovered from that uh, change, even though it's been several decades since it happened. Um, and I think that Trump sort of spoke to them in his, by his, uh, uh, his message of, quote, 